Welcome to the My Tech Tool Belt Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Shannon. And I'm Brenda. And this is a podcast where we highlight educators who innovate, engage, and inspire through the use of technology. Thank you so much for joining us today for episode 42 of the My Tech Tool Belt Podcast. Hi, this is Brenda Argano. Are you at a school with a lot of Chromebooks? How are you using them? Has the Chromebook just become a digital worksheet? Are your students just consumers? Or are they becoming creators? Well, wouldn't it be great if you could turn on your student's creative side and see where it would lead? Join us today as we speak with Ryan O'Donnell, a high school video production teacher from California. He shares with us so many creative ways to have your students creating with Chrome in no time. And just wait until you check out his unbelievable templates that he is willing to share with you. You can check this out through the links in our show notes attached to this episode and also on our website, mytechtoolbelt.com. So without further ado, our interview with Ryan O'Donnell. Hey, everybody, it's Shannon Tobaldo here on the My Tech Tool Belt podcast, and we are so excited to have our guest today, Ryan O'Donnell, coming live, not really in our studio, but live via Zoom. Yay! Uh, Yay! (laughs) And Ryan is a fellow podcaster. Yay! We're so excited. Love (laughs) podcasting. I love talking podcasts with podcasters. This is fun. It's so, it's like geeking out. It's like podcast inception. It's so fun. And you've got a great voice. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Kinda... I need to yell at my wife in the other room because we always joke about that. She's like, oh. <laughs> oh so today we, uh, we've invited Ryan to talk about creating with Chrome. It's a super exciting topic. It's, it's web-based tools, uh, helping our kids kind of reach that level of creativity and not just consumption as in their devices and in their experiences in school. So thanks for being on the show with us today, Ryan. Yes, and welcome. Uh, yeah, welcome. Well, hey, thanks for having me, you guys. I Like I was, said before, I really appreciate I love having conversations. That's why I think myself, and if I could speak on the behalf of so many others who podcast, we just love ca- have conversations. And so it's it, it's great to be the, yeah, the opportunity to be able to do this because I think, you know, we often talk about sharing is caring and we all get better. And so this right. is great. I love these opportunities. Right. And perfect. we love listening to your podcast we as do. well. And so... <laughs> I think it was probably one of the first podcasts that Brenda was like, go listen to this one <laughs> oh, when we yes. were thinking about doing podcasting. And I was like, ooh, I like that one. Yeah. Um, hey, so this is a great time for a shameless plug. The show is called <laughs> Check This Out. And my dear, dear friend, Brian Briggs, and I have been doing this originally as an Egg Ted podcast, but we kind of just, as the two of us, you know, move throughout our world, like all of us do, we find cool things that we should check out. Sometimes it's a, something we're listening to. Sometimes it's a book. Sometimes it's a tech tool. And we just wanted to be able to take an opportunity to share some of these things out. It's becoming much more erratic and funny along the way and it's much more time for the two of us to just get together and chat and if people want to jump in and listen it's a lot of fun so yeah if you so if you want to give it a check out uh check this out is what it's called right check this out. and i i learn something every time i listen to one and it's entertaining as well which is so fun and you've got a great title check this out <laughs> like check this out check this, this out, out. And you feel like, like, I felt like we knew you guys before we knew you guys. Yes. If that makes sense. It's such a sincere podcast. And like, there's no personas. It's just, that's just who you guys are. Mm -hmm. You guys are just chilling, hanging out. So it's so, it's super cool. So we appreciate it. We appreciate you. you. Um, Tell us a little bit about you and just like introduce yourself to our, to our listeners because they can get to know you on the podcast, but where do you, where do you come from? So I'll I'll do this super fast because like so many of us, our stories are varied and long. I never thought I'd ever get an education. Uh, I primarily was from the uh, from the athletic world. I went to high school, didn't know what I wanted to do. And I played football. Next thing you know, people are saying, do you want to come play football for us? So I go to University of Nevada, play football up there on scholarship. And then same thing there, finish there. Like, I don't know what I want to do. (laughs) Graduated with a degree that had nothing to do with education. Criminal justice, by the way. Wow. And then uh, someone goes, hey, you can go out to Europe and play football still. I'm like, "Uh, I can. I'm like, sure, they'll pay you a little bit. So next thing I know, I'm in a small suburb outside Munich, Germany, playing football. The head coach quits. I go to my college coach. I'm like, I think I want to coach. He goes, well, you're a little bit too late. He goes, why don't you go down the local high schools. I'll call a guy. You can help out over there. 
Next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assisting coaching at a high school and the, the high school staff and I are getting along and they're like, you know what, you should get a job at the high school here. So I went back to school. I'm like, let me teach something and literally had to go back to college. And some counselor looked at my credits and she goes, you're kind of close for history. You want to try that? I'm like, sure. <laughs> it's done. And then next thing you know, history, we got a job, did the coaching thing. And then the football sort of waned in my life. Uh, love started getting really passionate about teaching history and Along the entire way, I've always felt like I wanted to use cool tools. I wanted to try to help that coaching staff back in the 90s when I was helping them, when they were writing all their stuff down on paper towels and <laughs> napkins and just cross the place. And I'm like, hey, guys, we can use this. We have this thing called Microsoft Office and Windows 3.1. And I'm like, I can make up a cool little playbook. And I felt like I was always trying to infuse some tech to help coaching better and then try to help history better. And then as I kept moving and moving on, about four or five years ago, um, I had the opportunity in my district where I'm at now in Rockland, California, to be able to be a TOSA to try to help a lot lot of the teachers in my K-12 district, and I really love doing that when I got to get in the different classrooms. Same sort of idea. How can we be able to get tools to help leverage student learning? And along this whole way, I found a huge passion, much like why I do the podcast, about helping other teachers. It's really sort of exciting realizing that if you help one teacher, that's going to impact, who knows, 35 to a couple hundred kids. And exponentially, it's really kind of, it's a little bit of addicting. Did the TOSA thing for about three years, and then a job opened up back at my same old high school where I taught history for a long time. The principal said, hey, Ryan, we need someone to teach video production. And used to love doing video stuff in your history class and doing funny little videos. You want to do it? Let's do that. So now I'm in a bit of a renaissance and I'm teaching video production. I'm in my uh, sec- third year doing this and learning. And I feel like even though I'm 48, I feel like I'm I'm 23 all over again, trying to be able to learn a, a new world of stuff and try to connect with kids. But meanwhile, try to be able to give them some life skills and also really kind of be able to have fun too. And so that's my, that's my story. That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> when you're When you're teaching video production... I'm curious as to, are you connecting with other teachers to connect the content to, for example, like their history class or their English class or literature, or are are you kind of using your own standards and your own pieces? A little bit of both. I really find... When we, when we all work together and help each other out, it benefits everybody. And I remember when I was teaching history, I kept thinking, gosh, dang it, if I'm teaching the Russian Revolution right now, it would be fantastic if I could really coordinate with my language arts teacher and have them doing Animal Farm the same time I'm doing the Russian Revolution. And it, we always struggled and because it fit differently for our curriculum and time. And I'm like, man, if we could make that work better. And now I'm thinking even in this next thing, if I could be able to help those U.S. history teachers who are doing their end of the semester speakeasy things and, and making a video as one of them, I could be there as an assistant to be able to help out with some of those basic storyboarding and even as simple too as I offer my equipment. So I try to be able to be there as much as I can for others. And I really think that particularly at the high school, it's such a community. It really is its own little village. And if we can kind of work together and collaborate and it makes everything so much better. And so I'm trying to be able to reach out to those other things. We're very much a a school where we've had staff for a long, long time. And everybody's just kind of created their own little... uh, I won't say fiefdoms. That sounds a little, <laughs> but they're all little, just this is the ways we, we have done things. And right, so right. sometimes innovation and sometimes collaboration, it's a little bit of a tough to be able to get out of the norm. But yes, I really would like to be able to do more of that. I always think that's so much more impactful when you can really make it cross-curricular and, you know, have an impact on other learning. So tell us a little bit about it's Rockland High School. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Home of the Thunder, baby. We are a sound. <laughs> who, who else has a mascot that is a sound? Every school that we run into, it's just they're going to make fun of us. Which logo? It's the lightning bolt. Like, lightning bolt's not a sound. Yeah. <laughs> lightning bolt is lightning, not thunder. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and so so how big is this school? We're, we're in a growth period here. We're about 2,200 kids. Yeah, so not the biggest school, uh, but pretty significant and, a little, and way larger than the school had originally intended. So yeah, so my classes I teach of uh, what we call I'm in the CTE world, and so we talk about pathways. So how kids can take the video production one, two, three, and move through, looking to try to be able to get three years of. Uh, this pathway to be able to get kids a little bit more career ready and interested in that. And then I also started a brand new class that I had to pitch and I'm doing it right now. And the idea of what you guys mentioned before is how can we be there for others? Athletics is a big part of of high schools and there's so many kids who participate. And I feel like we're just not doing the greatest job in terms of telling their stories, promoting and celebrating. Because I think that's the biggest thing that schools need to be able to do with social media and connecting with the community and others is promote upcoming events and right. celebrate what you've done. I think that's what needs to, what your website needs to be about. I think that's what your social media presence needs needs to be about is solely those two things. And you need to be tagging and tweeting and doing all that sort of stuff. And I felt like my administration is going to struggle because I don't know if you've seen every administrator on the planet, they are to the hilt with too much to be able to do. And they all realize they want to be able to do that for their schools. But 
Uh, how can you do that? So do you find a teacher? And so I said, hey, if you give me a class, I'm going to do a couple things. We're going to talk about the athletic world in terms of careers, but we're also going to be able to go out. We're going to film athletic events. We're going to create promotional videos. We're going to do highlight videos. We're going to learn about the industry. So we're looking at sports documentaries right now. And then on, on top of that, we're going to take over the social media piece as well, too. And Very so we're nice. going out there and trying to be able to promote upcoming games and celebrating the kid who was this and that. And the one I'm really excited about, I didn't get to do it during the fall, but we're going to start it now, is we are embedding one of the students from my, my class in different sports. We're going to send filmers with them, GoPro the kid. And now they're going to go like, hey, everybody. And I got, I want to make it a real fish out of water experience. Mm -hmm. I want to take the girl who's 95 pounds at, at best and have her go out on the wrestling team. Mm -hmm. She's going to be out there and we're going to be filming her and she's going to be taking part of practice. And she's going to be afterwards when they get a water break, she's going to come over and we're going to do a little, a lot of that sort of like reality show stuff, talk about her experiences and sort of follow what it's like to be on the wrestling team and then pick her up and now put her over here. And so we got a, a boy and a girl and we're going to embed them in these different sort of programs. Uh, it's called behind the mask or behind the helmet or whatever sport that we're doing, mm -hmm. sort of get a good look at sort of all of these sort of sports. Sports. Many times those sports that we don't know a whole, whole bunch about to sort of give them promote and let kids know more about them. I love that. And then if you could also include the uh, performing arts and, yeah. and mm -hmm. you know all these other people yeah. that or clubs and things that oh, don't, yeah. don't get as much recognition. I think that'd be yeah. great. Yeah, the other one for clubs are doing to have a bunch of kids. They do this thing called Wheel of Clubs. They spin a wheel and wherever it lands, and of course we fake it, <laughs> <laughs> lands on the yoga club. So we just did yoga club, and I got a, I got a football kid who's doing this, and he's oh. really, he's 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 a large large man. He's two hundred seventy pounds, and oh we're like, that's God. it, Tim. You're going to the yoga club, <laughs> yeah. and we filmed him doing the yoga club, and and the advisor of the yoga club has just been so thankful. She's like, oh my gosh. We did this whole little thing on just my yoga club. There's like eight of us in it. And thank you so much for making a little segment and such. So a little balance of fun, but also, you know, get, get the word out if you want to try some yoga. Hey, Tim did it. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's awesome. And then it gives everyone a perspective like this is not easy. You know, you mm -hmm. may be making fun of this group, but it's not easy. Yoga is not easy. Mm -hmm. Dance is not yeah. easy. No. Singing mm -hmm. is not easy. Well, all these things that you, yeah. you know, you think, oh, ho, ho, those people, those yeah. geeks or whatever, you know, yeah. like. Oh. And although we were try, trying to be, I want to do, bring a balance of fun and information, all these things. But I think the biggest thing that we need to do for kids these days in high schools is you gotta, and it's always been this way, but it's even more no, more now, the social, emotional right. uh, issues that kids are dealing with. And I think the biggest thing is if we can get kids to connect one way or another to something on campus, it's going to it's going to help so much and helps in many ways, even save kids. I mean, yeah, we've yeah. all had some awful struggles. We have been dealing with way too many deaths at our high school over the past five, seven years. And it's just, it's just so saddening to be able to see, you know, everything from drugs to suicide. And you're like, gosh, dang it. And you just want to, you know, what's happening. And just if, in our own little way, if you could be able to make your classrooms, your programs, your clubs, your VAPA, your whatever, something where kids can come and can connect. Absolutely. Um, it's it's going to pay big dividends, I think. Yeah. Connecting with an adult and then connecting with each other. Mm -hmm. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the key. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's transition just a little bit from, you know, from all the cool stuff that you're doing to more specifically, how are, how are your students and how are you guiding them through this creative opportunity in Chrome? Yeah, create with Chrome. Originally, myself and my, and Brian Briggs and a couple of others, we've always talked. We've been talking about how amazing the Chromebooks are. Andy Losick, our, our friend from Michigan, put out a, a blog post a couple of years ago, and it was about how I think it was a Go Guardian report came out and showed the the Chromebook usage and it was uh, some statistics about what all these. It's amazing how many Chromebooks are being sold, but what are they being used for? And it was pretty shocking and not in a good way. It was basically all consumption kind of the things. Mm -hmm. It was YouTube videos. It was Accelerator Reader. It was whatever that Go Fund Math thing is. Google Docs, and it was just basically like where are sort of these other things that we want want kids to be able to be doing in terms of creative tools because we keep talking about it, but it seems like people are just consuming. And then in just my anecdotal stuff whenever I ask people, hey, what are your teachers and what are your kids, everybody doing with Chromebooks? And I'm like, yeah, you walk around and there's a lot of a lot of people who are just using them as, as stuff to be able to get. So that kind of was a little bit more of a kick in the pants to be able to say, hey, let's try to be able to show that there are other tools to be able to use. And not necessarily just that, is can you look at existing tools in different ways, particularly the G Suite stuff? And have you guys seen that as well too, about how you can be able to change some of the Google, particularly Google Slides and drawing about to be able to really transform it into different kind of learning opportunities? Yeah, we've we've been trying to, I know in the work that we've been doing, we've been really trying to push teachers to think beyond, uh, and for us, it's Google Classroom. Like Google Classroom seems to be like the hub. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they just keep saying, 
well, I'm putting some, you know, I'm putting a worksheet or I'm pushing this form that they need to fill out or they're making a Google slide. And, and so by introducing things like even just the edge protocols um, and some of the other more creative pieces, it's almost mind blowing. Like they go, wait, we want our kids to do what now? Instead, <laughs> like I thought I was the teacher. And so pushing those teachers a little bit is to just open their minds to letting the kids create something has been, I find it that it's been a challenge and kind of some of the work that we've been doing. So what, cause it's, cause it's a real shift. It's a huge shift. It's a shift yeah. from, from me as the teacher providing you with the content to me providing you with an idea or a concept and you as a student coming back and giving me the content. And that's mm -hmm. cool. I think that's yeah. cool. The two biggest tools that everybody uses, use docs and slides mm -hmm. and with, with docs, everybody's thinking, all right, write me something right right mm -hmm. and share it with me with google classroom or for me we use schoology but it's basically the same idea mm -hmm. you share it with me back and forth or the other one is google slides which is make a presentation and either present it in front of class or just share turn it, it into me. me and like well both of those things are just boring yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, but like change them a different way and as yeah. soon as I, it's crazy when you do this you tell people hey go to file page setup change your layout and change the background, background color, color. And you're like, oh, wow. So it could be something different. You're like, yes, it can. And then people ask, well, what can it be? And you feel like you're like, Willy Wonka, it could be anything you want. Right. It's magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, and just changing the background color, you know, to something other than white or black, like those are usually more typical, but like, I don't know, change it to your school colors or change mm -hmm. it to just even the, like um, an off yellow or a cream color mm -hmm. is just more soothing. And what I like, uh, your, your name's paperless, right? Yeah, uh, paper, I'm the paperless professor. You're the yes. paperless. So you're paperless. <laughs> and here's the thing. When you change the color, instantly it tells me one thing. This is not paper. This is not being printed. This is something right. different. So that's why I say change your color, people. It instantly tells me that this is nothing being turned in. I just had this this last week. A kid come up to me and goes, Mr. Dong, like, hey, do you get a hole puncher in here? And I'm like, no, I don't have a hole puncher, nor do I have a stapler in my room. Right. Why like, do I why? need that? I don't have them. Like, I haven't given you a piece of paper, and nor am I ever going to give you one. So why would I want a hole puncher? And they're like, oh, that's a good point. And he's got his, guess what he has? He has his English paper that he needs to hold bunch or something like that or whatever. I'm like, okay, so that's my biggest thing, folks, is I would say, first off, go into your settings, start changing the backgrounds of them and thinking about them. What do you want them to do with the thing? And thinking about, you even said changing the shape. So, mm -hmm. you know, changing things from, you know, landscape to a more full screen experience to give yourself more real estate to work with, especially like in Google Slides. Oh, yeah. um, I think a lot of people don't know that you can actually change the shapes and the sizes of that was my biggest game changer. Yeah. Right. I remember I'm checking out at Safeway. I'm sitting there and I'm not teaching history anymore. And I saw a gorgeous looking Nat, Nat Geo sitting there on the checkout stand. I'm like, gosh dang it, Genghis Khan, look at that. And I looked at the corner. I thought, really? You're charging like 13 bucks for yeah. a Nat Geo? Like yeah. that's ridiculous. And I'm like, I'm thumbing through it. I'm like, that's gorgeous. And I thought, man. I bought it anyway. And so I'm sitting at home reading it and I thought, man, this is just me though. I mean, it would be cool for my kids to be able to like see this and I can't get them each a copy or whatever. I'm not even teaching history anymore. But, and I thought, well, what if I had to make this? Yeah. And I thought, all right, here it is. Genghis Khan magazine has been the impetus of kind of this entire thing, which was I went to Google Slides, did file page setup, made it vertical. From there, I started putting a bunch of layouts and try to be able to recreate this National Geographic magazine with Genghis Khan. And instead of putting text, I just put text boxes and I put filler text in there. I put Latin in there. And I thought, okay, this is basically going to be a template. If, you, if any kid wants to be able to make their own National Geographic, I went out and got a Nat Geo logo with a transparent background. And then if you put in the, you know, you get it all set up. I had the yellow border. I got the logo. I put in the fake barcode. I put all that stuff in. And next thing you know, I'm like, hey, here's this little fake thing. And, I, and then I put it out there on the social media world and shared it in my, all my conference sessions. And it has been it's been crazy about how much people think that I can make my own digital magazine of this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, so now I made Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated, Wired. Right. And I just basically changed the layout a little bit. And I have these all on my um, on my website if anybody wants to be able to check it out at creativeedtech.com and go to templates. And it's just so relatively simple to be able to just do this. And it's been so 
eye-opening thing for a lot of people to realize and they're like how do you do this i mean is this my program i'm like that's the best part about it is that it's google slides and what's great about it is for these reasons one is it's a tool they already know and they use right and they're going to use it for this and they're also going to use it for other things and then it, it takes away learning a new tool because i hate like hey let's use this one tool for this one lesson that we're never going to use it again like you want to get really familiar and comfortable with all of this so now that as they get stronger with design and if you can take the design challenge out of it and now really it's about the content mm-hmm. then you're really learning more about Genghis Khan. And we're going to continue this more down the road. And then you mentioned earlier in the day about how I'm doing with my kids. So my kids, I'm I'm moving them more towards, we use the Adobe suite of tools. So we're using Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Premiere for video production. But I still want them to have a basic background in some of the uh, things. So in many ways, we we talk about Google Slides, but I think Google Slides really is is kind of like Photoshop 101. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. It's it's almost like the gateway because the tool and the skill set is like transferable. So if you know mm-hmm. you know that you need to like insert some images or change the background colors or do that. If you know that skill and how to accomplish that in Google Slides, you should be able to transfer that pretty easily over into to the Adobe Photoshop. It's Sweet. everything. Yeah. The number one thing is this, is I always do the joke from Shrek. I go, it's about layers. <laughs> if you understand layers and from Shrek, it's like, hey, onions have layers, <laughs> ogres have layers, and Google Slides has layers, <laughs> and Photoshop has layers, and Adobe Premiere Pro has layers. And they're like, what's layers? And I'm like, that's all we're going to talk about all yeah. year is things, layers. On top, things on bottom. And then they're like, okay, they understand layers. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. tell us about, you sent us over uh, an example of an activity that we'll share with in our show notes and on our website. But tell us about kind of the experiences that you're giving your students when it comes to creating using some of these Google Chrome tools. So the t- two of my m- sort of like the intro and get you started lessons is one is I'd like to do a little uh, movie poster idea to be able to get kids to share. I want, I talk all the time about movies. I'm a big movie freak and I want them to share some of the things that they watch. I mentioned before about, Hey, you know, kids consume. I'm like, okay, if you're consumed, so tell me about what you're consuming. So I showed them about how we can be able to use Google Slides as a way to be able to go get some movie posters or TV shows that they're doing, drop them into a document, and then how to be able to layer them, like we just said, which one goes on top of another, how to be able to insert text and word art, how to be able to change borders and drop shadows, and then how to be able to, at the end, how to be able to file, export this thing out as a a file type. So we have conversations, the difference of a ping and a JPEG. We're talking about colors. First off, I give them an example. I show them. I give them a Google Doc that has a change of background color, by the way. (laughs) And uh, in there, I have my movie poster collage and the description of the assignment. I want you to be able to start playing around X, Y, and Z. This is what mine looks like. Down here on the bottom is this open area. I want you to make yours, download it, boom, 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 and then you put yours into here. I walk them through those steps, and then the kids now have time in class to be able to do this, and they're learning some of those basic uh, steps and tools along the way, and it's been really sort of helpful to get them comfortable with that. And the other lesson that I do along the same sort of thing, the first thing I start off, I love doing a, a by the numbers infographics. And so when the kids come in, the first lesson of the year I have them do is I have them tell me about their summer by the numbers and they have to come up with 10 things they did over the summer and they have to associate a number with it to sort of think about being creative. So if they traveled to, let's say we went to New Mexico for a softball tournament or something like that. I'm like, okay, do the mileage on Google Google Maps. How far did you drive? And type that in. We traveled, you know, 2,497 miles in our SUV. And then how many uh, kids will go, I didn't do anything. I'm like, how many times did you watch The Office? And <laughs> right. they're like, oh, yeah. I watched that seven times. I'm like, okay. Some of the more creative kids definitely are sort of hesitant of template-driven stuff. They just want to go out and start their own. But it's really sort of a great introduction to those kind of design tools. And then the second piece, help me go paperless, is I, I, I wanted to go all in with the workflow. And it has made my life so much better, which is the create a system of every single thing that I do so that I never have a confusion of a first off something that's lost or how do I turn it in or how many points is it worth? And I'm saying that this is it. So like I mentioned before, I use Schoology and Schoology has this inter- integration very much like Google Classroom where I can create a document boom, give it to them. All 35 kids now have a copy. They do it, hit submit, and now I get it all back. The cool part about what Schoology, since it's integrated, so I can open it up within Schoology. The Google Doc is embedded right there inside the Schoology window, and I can go from student to student to see them. And also, I can go in the corner and hit type in the grade for it, leave a grade comment. All of those grades then go back into the into the grade book. So I never have to leave this. And so kids will come up to me still. <laughs> there's a few of them who are coming up to me at the end of the semester. Go, Mr. Donald, I thought I turned in the movie collage poster. And I'm like, hey, let's take a look at the grade book. I'm like, there's no submit uh, icon that's there. 
And they're like, what does that mean? I go, well, that means you did not hit submit. <laughs> and so in a wonderful back and forth flow that has made the paperless world just just so fantastic for me. Uh, from here on out, it's just what is the content I want to deliver to them and what do they want to bring uh, get back to me? Wow, that's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> and, and how do they feel about that, using that? Uh, I will say this, it's made it easy. There's not a lot of confusion and that's what's best. So it's almost any lack of... Uh, Lack of complaints is always a good thing, and they become very comfortable with it. We do, I do assessments within there, and so we never have to necessarily leave that world. The biggest helpful oftentimes is when parents, a case manager is contacting me and say, hey, what's going on? I'm like, hey, check Schoology. And they're like, oh, yeah, there's, they're missing. Hey, they're getting 27%. I'm like, yeah, they haven't done these things, and you know, here's how to be able to do them. And they go, how, where's the information? I'm like, well, you have access to them, so it's, it's all right there. And so it really makes it that the class does... Uh, I am the instructor on record, and I am there, but in many ways, it could kind of be a... Uh, a distance learning kind of a thing because it all lives in this online world. Mm -hmm. And when they're coming to your class, they're usually executing or creating the content or the instructions are not necessarily coming from you on paper. They're not coming from you in person. They're, everything lives in the learning management system. It does, but but it's both though. So like yeah. uh, I, will, I, I love Screencastify and uh, I use that for a, a fair amount of my stuff, but I also do a fair amount of Camtasia so for more of the heavy lifting. because it, and, it, and that's the hardest thing to do is that I would love to be able to almost have me out of the equation and not because I don't love standing and doing direct instruction because let me be honest, it is my favorite thing to do. <laughs> People always talk about like lecturing and I've done tons of sessions like break up with lecturing. By the way, I love lecturing. Yeah, Le we, Because we're teachers at heart. So lecture yes. is who we are. It's, it's, and I it's love storytelling. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. let me back up a little bit. So if I can create tons of these tutorials on how to be able to do it, it takes away from me doing the walkthrough. I still do the walkthrough, by the way, but that's sort of my my backup for the, hey, we had to go on a, a mock trial team and we were gone. So what did you guys do last time? I'm like, oh, yeah, I gave you a 25 minute tutorial on how to do a movie collage poster. And they're like, can you do it again for us? Like, oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, so, but now it's like, oh, hey, yeah, I have a tutorial online. Right. It's, open up the document, open up the Google Doc, and you'll see a link right there to it. So that way it is, and I'm not finished with all of them, but that's the goal. If I could be able to do my introduce, every day I kind of start with the story. Start, start with the story, get the kids kind of hooked a little bit. I also like to try to be able to ask them. I try to walk from group to group to group and have a little question of the day for them. And then from there, break into a little, uh, have that question transition into a story that I'm going to tell. Then from there, give any direct instruction and then spend the rest of the time working. But if I could have those tutorials in the background to be able to help out for the kids who either weren't there or more importantly, the kids who it was too fast or they didn't get it. You know, there it is. I mean, the, if YouTube has proven anything, the, the amount of tutorials and what we, how we all learn now is all done through. Let me watch somebody who can demonstrate it. And so I say, folks, get Screencastify. It is fan, fantastic. Make some of your tutorials because it's so helpful for people who be able need to be able to go back and look about your instruction. Well, especially you as an instructor, if you've done this any more than I think a year or two, and you already know which questions they're going to ask you every year mm -hmm. because it's happened now two, three, four times. So if you could kind of eliminate, first of all, you need to go back and redesign your instructions or something like that, especially if they're written. But secondly, if you can kind of hit some of the, the most frequently asked questions, let me hit a couple of these. I still get grad students asking me the same questions questions, even though it's like three times somewhere in the material, it's in the content, it's in the assignment, it's in here. And they'll still say, I was supposed to do what again? And so then I go, okay, well, you, you didn't read or didn't watch or didn't listen. Mm -hmm. So let's go through one more time. I'm going to point you in the direction of where those instructions either are written or audio or video. Yeah. Right. And so I feel like now I've been teaching some of these courses for seven years now, and I feel like I've got it down. All of my instructions are written. And there's a video of me talking about really specifically how to do it. And then there's also audio audio transcription. So everything's closed captioned on my videos. So oh, fantastic. I feel like, yeah, that's great. Yeah, you know, thank you, YouTube. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, no. but at the end of the day, I feel like if they watched or read, I I've hit kind of most of my pieces and I can just point them back to, and not that I'm not going to answer a question, right? right that right. they send me know, an email, yeah. but I'm going to be able to say, here's the instructions again, but also you can find them here and here in Schoology, which is what I use as well. And mm -hmm. um, I feel like those are kinds, of, and, and I have students that are adults, they're adult learners, and they still need to kind of see or hear things multiple mm -hmm. times. And that's mm -hmm. totally fine. 
I watch videos. That, I know. Times. I do. Yeah, that's, what, that's what we do as humans, right? Yeah. We yeah. need to be able to. Yeah. Everybody pauses for a second. We're not like, oh, wrapped with attention. Like, you're right. the greatest storyteller of all time. I'm listening <laughs> to every word that you're saying. Like, no, it's impossible for us to be able to, particularly when it's when it's very much like bullet point driven. Like, do this, then do this, then do this. Mm-hmm. You mix step. You miss step seven. You're like, well, I'm going to be lost in step nine. So yeah. that's okay. Take your time. Go back and look at it. And rewind. And we get, you know, often, mm-hmm. and especially in online courses too, uh, distance learning or that type of stuff. My mind wanders. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, as I'm listening to, you know, the instructor or the video or whatever it is, I'm thinking about how that could impact me or what I could be doing. And then I'm like, oh, and now they've they've gone on. They've gone on. And I'm like, wait, shoot, that was probably important. I need to go back, rewind, Mm -hmm. rewind. I think using something like Screencastify is one of my favorites. And I think I always tell teachers you can probably get away with the free version because Mm -hmm. it caps you, I think, at 10 or 15 minutes and nobody needs to hear you more than 10 or 15 minutes for anything. Like if, yeah. if, if you shouldn't be ever going more than that. Yeah. I pay for Screencastify because, for a couple of reasons. Sometimes I want to go a little bit longer. I also the like the idea that you can export them as, as animated GIFs if you get the paid version. And there's also part of me too, is that I, I really want to, I really want to help pay for developers who do phenomenal yeah. stuff, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? And, and it's so not that expensive. It, I think it's like 30, $39 or, or so $29, for a whole year, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's very reasonable for the yeah. paid version of Screencastify. Now, on the other side, Camtasia, I would not pay for that personally. I was able to use some of our my, my funds to be able to get that because that is much pricier. You can do more robust things to super zoom in on your mouse and mm-hmm. snag it, though. I have yeah. been very impressed. So I've used uh, Camtasia and I just recently purchased Snag It for a pretty reasonable price. Um, And it does a lot of the zooming and the special Mm -hmm. effect in the video production, which I was very impressed Mm -hmm. with and a fraction of the cost. It's more than Screencastify, but it's Mm -hmm. less than Camtasia. And I was, I was very happy with Snagit and it has a lot of really cool like shapes and animations Mm -hmm. and edit in and out. So for some of the quick little videos where I want to be like, focus here, it has that little, you yeah. know, a circle or a square where it'll zoom right yeah. in. And and the cool part on all this, I'm te- are those tools, some of you may be thinking like, I don't do video stuff. Like he's a video guy or like, no, 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 the, these, they're so simple. Like literally you click on, first off, you got to get a microphone and there's thousands of mics to get, but you click on record uh, a Chrome extension, <laughs> yeah. hit record. And you're like, okay, we're recording now. Follow my mouse and hit done. <laughs> and then what do you do afterwards? And it says, do you want to put this on YouTube? Okay. Sure. Like, it's that easy done. people. It is not. I mean, literally you can get, you know, I got cookies. How, what do I do next? I cut them into circles and put them in the oven. That's yeah. it. It's, it's easy bake oven kind of stuff, people. But sometimes you need to, especially when it's something a little bit technical and you're like, I could type this out, like uh, helping someone oh. do something in their, uh, let's say like their G suite, management system, right? Like I was trying to help somebody and I was like, you need to go here and then you need to go here and then you need to go here. And it's like, you know, seven or eight steps or I in literally 30 seconds, I could record, I could screen record that, send it as an animated gift to them and it's done. Mm -hmm. What is more powerful? The right. video. Yeah, absolutely. The video and is Shan- the most Shannon, I would like to j- just commend you on the correct pronunciation of gift. I'm sorry. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm team gif. I am team gif. I know there's team Jeff. No. Uh, no, no, it's not a thing. I'm not, I'm not of that team. <laughs> uh, it's not peanut butter. I'm sorry. It's just not, <laughs> um, but I love it. I love it. So how has this changed your, your students' perspective? I mean, obviously they love video production. Your classes are probably mm. some of the most sought after. <laughs> I would take your class. No, no, note the comment I said before about teenagers. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine like being able to be in a class where I get to go be embedded in a yoga class or I get to go I be at the football game and take the video and then do some post editing highlights. I will say this though, but the heart, the challenge in all of it is, and I, I, I always love to try to be able to push back on those people who say the kids these days, oh, kids these days, but there is the reality of it is a challenge. It is that yoga video, by the way, took a month to produce and the kids struggled so much with the process uh, of trying to be able to get it done because it uh, some of the work is hard. It sounds relatively easy, but there's for so many of the things, there's the technical piece, which is a little bit of a challenge. And what I've noticed more and more is it's a hard time for the kids to be able to, it's a risk. Like when I'm just saying, grab your equipment, they know the equipment, they know how to edit a video. But now I'm like, you got to go to the yoga club. And there's there's only eight girls in there who are doing yoga. And there's three of these guys who are going to go up. And, and they were extremely nervous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so to the point of, 
it was it was hard to be able to get them to actually go and do it. It was great when we were brainstorming the idea, right? And now when it came to all that stuff, it's a challenge. And that's probably been the biggest challenge I've had is that I have a whiteboard filled. We get crazy ideas that we throw up all the time. We're like, love it, let's do it. And you're like, oh boy, it's <laughs> yeah. And then just and then also too, it's just it, it, it's a challenge to motivate kids to be able to do things. Yeah. And I live in it. I live in the world of electives. And I teach at a school where we have what's called an A-B block schedule. So the kids have four classes one day, four another. So I know they're sitting on eight classes. I'm one of eight Wow. that they have to juggle. And I, I, and I really honestly believe I'm probably the, mo- the eighth most important of all of them. And so trying to be able to many times get them to go do the stuff. They have a lot of other stuff on their plate. On top of that, their own social, emotional wellness and being, and they should spend time with friends and family and all of that. And now I'm trying to say, hey, by the way, you got to get to the choir concert tonight and you're going to, you signed up to go film the choir concert. So there's, there's, there's a lot of struggles to be able to, to move from what they want to do and what I want to do to actually make it, make it. Well, good for you. Keep good. trying. Keep doing it because I think I think, <laughs> I think you talked about CTE and how you're kind of living in the career and technical education space, and mm-hmm. I feel like that's a space that we've neglected as an mm-hmm. as a as a country for a while. Like when mm-hmm. we left, kind of the world of CTE, which was back, I think. I don't know, 30 years ago, oh, yeah. yeah, for 30 or 40 years ago when there was Gone still the shop auto yeah. shop and right. home ec. And, you know, we don't teach a lot of these career pathways anymore. And I, I feel like we're doing a disservice to our students by not having these opportunities because by exposing a student to video production, you may have unleashed the next George Lucas or the mm-hmm. next Steven Spielberg, or, you know what I mean? You sparked the mm-hmm. creativity of like, This could be a career path for me. And by not having these classes, we're eliminating things like home finance. Right. Mm -hmm. People don't know. Kids don't know how to balance their checkbooks anymore. A checkbook? Nobody even has checkbooks anymore. But they don't know how to manage money. They don't know how to repair things. I no, mean, just gonna throw it away. they're just going to throw it away. And so <laughs> I feel like the space that you're living in, in video production and audio production and just having a sense of responsibility to your team and to the production world as a whole is so important. And it, it may not seem that way now, but I bet in 20 years, you're going to have some movie makers or less. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> Come and back. You, and, I, and you do have some now, which is nice. So you have some of those uh, some of those rock stars who just uh, on a weekly basis I'm I'm stuck and I think, "Oh god, I need where's Nolan? Where's that 16-year-old? I need his help." Like I'm constantly <laughs> thinking like I don't need to and I try to do it myself too. I'm trying to be able to produce videos. My life is crazy busy because we do a we do a we do a talent show and our our big talent shows that is Wednesday and my talent is I do I try to do a funny video. And so I've been doing this for about 10 years. Another teacher and I we often we run around campus and something that always happens and such. So this year we uh we went through a storm you know, coming back to school, we went through some Wizard of Oz kind of storm and we ended up at the backwards, the backwards of our school. So it's our school pronounced uh, spelled backwards and every teacher is opposite. And so it allows for us to be kind of snarky. We're running around ca- campus and we're finding out of all these sort of things, you know, and we're making fun of some of the things in kind of a lighthearted way. And I'm going to make like this little eight minute video about all of this. Like, you know, some of the bald teachers all got wigs and we're walking <laughs> we're sitting back around campus like, what is happening? <laughs> and such. And so, um, I'm trying to do some of these special effects and I'm struggling and I'm leaning on, <laughs> leaning on the the strength of some rock star 16 year olds to really kind of come through and go, Oh, I, I know how to do a hurricane tornado effect. With Very this. cool. Like, oh, perfect. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Hey, and what you mentioned before about CTE, it's just, I just want to be able to say a hundred percent yes on all that sort of stuff is that we have been so much driven about getting kids into colleges. I think that we have forgotten a lot about uh, that other direction. And if anybody wants to listen to, I think there it's gotta be on YouTube somewhere, but Mike Rowe from Dirty jobs did a wonderful talk in front of congress i think it was back in maybe 2017 and i loved his whole thing he did this wonderful show on dirty jobs and and his big revelation of the whole thing was that he has found people who do the worst job and his entire life everybody always says do something you're passionate about and he says the opposite he says i met these people i don't know how many people are passionate to pick up roadkill every single day but he goes in the eight years i did this show i met the most happy people who love their jobs. And it was in complete contrast of finding a passion. And he goes, there's something about us where it's almost a little bit of a service that we're all not going to find a job that we're totally passionate about. 
So he says, really sort of shift your thinking in terms of finding connections in your own life and really an emphasis about uh, that there are so many wonderful jobs and careers that are out there in the CTE programs. And so the nice part you, you mentioned too, that we've forgotten about it. I will say this is that even at the national level is that funding is really kicking in for a mm-hmm. lot of these things because these programs do this isn't like we just need textbooks. You need a lot of mm-hmm. uh, sometimes expensive stuff. And so I feel like funding is really kind of there for a lot of our programs. And it's figuring out that that, that funding is available and knowing what to do with it. And it's oh. not just, you know, it's not just go buy a couple of pieces. You know, this is mm-hmm. it's an ongoing and sustainable opportunity uh, when mm-hmm. done right. And so mm-hmm. and um, finding the teachers and too. finding the teachers. That's another thing is I think we, oh, we don't have a, qualified teachers. <laughs> I have a school, I have an inner city Catholic school in LA who cannot find someone to come out and teach mm-hmm. woodshop <laughs> to, to, to these wow. kids. And now mm-hmm. granted, it's a, it's a part-time gig, but, and they have the funding. The school has the funding to pay this person to come out once a week. I've said, we've tried the local l- lumber yards. We've tried, really? we've tried, uh, you oh, know, yeah. I reached out to my family who work in construction and they're like, I'm not going to, to teach like one day a week. And I'm like, why not? Like <laughs> you can make a little extra money and you would be doing like a, such a service, service to these kids, mm-hmm. but the kids are learning knitting. They're learning uh, cooking. Uh, and she's basing it off the Finland mm-hmm. program, right. Teach for Finland, because Finland has these kind of really cool, really embedded life skill programs in their education system. And they have to learn how to use saws and drills mm-hmm. and equipment. But but the need for teachers is unbelievable. unbelievable. You hit it on the head. There is it is just such a demand out there. We have a retiring teacher this year, and we're like, what are we going to do? Like, let's offer this. And the principal, and everybody's like, uh, you got to get a teacher for that. Yeah. Like, you're going to be able to find just a graphic design teacher. I'm like, yeah, we will. We'll scour <laughs> the nation. We'll we'll shout from the Utah the rooftops. I go. I, I said this. I go. I'll get on Twitter. I'll ask. And I realize what I'm going to get back is because it's going to be crickets. Crickets. Yeah. And, yeah. We don't. And, and, and the hard part is our the, the school right now next to us has got like a phenomenal teacher who teaches graphic like let's get her like straight up trying to recruit her and steal her <laughs> and like no like it, it's not yeah so if, i mean if I mean, if you've got folks who are thinking about getting into jobs people there's a lot of those opportunities now they're not tons of them though but there's needs you know like like my school we have 14 math teachers or like there's always going to be there's a need for a lot of math teachers you know and you may be thinking well great i want to get into child development, you know, CT pathway, you're like, okay, there may be a school out there, but it's not like the school around the corner needs three of you. So right, right. a little bit of a challenge, but yeah, the need, the need for quality teachers and not just people who know those things. The other hard part is sometimes you're going to get industry people who are not teachers. don't understand pedagogy yeah, and no. connecting with kids. And they're like, yes, we see that a lot of people who are just focused on the content almost more than those days of the history teacher who was, I just want to lecture on World War II. And like, well, now you got somebody who just really wants to get into the eight bit drill saw. And you're like, no, no, connect with kids, dude. That's where the TOSA role. And I think the teacher leaders and coaches are really important because if you can capitalize on someone who has the expertise in the industry and you can pair them with someone who can help them connect with students, um, and teach them some just best practices and pedagogy. And, you know, there's some things <laughs> that I've seen and you're like, yeah, we don't do that anymore. That was like, we don't make kids publicly embarrassed anymore. We don't do, we try not to do that for their own well being and for, you know, creating these safe spaces. So teaching them how to really connect with their student is key because that we can capitalize on their knowledge and expertise. So pairing them up, but that also becomes really expensive when we're talking about in the education system, coaches is an additional expense um, as well. So, so, so need, so needed expense. Though. It's a, it's an, it's a necessity, and I think, I hope that we're seeing more and more funding be put into those spaces as mm-hmm. well, because educators have to continue to learn and grow as well, and have a mindset to be open. Because Absolutely, that's, I think, a big struggle. Mm-hmm. I just, I love, I love Carol Dweck. I mean, I love her oh, yeah. talking about how we can move forward with our students, but also uh, as us as educators. Okay, so Ryan, <laughs> take us to. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm listening to this podcast. I want to, I want to do this next week. I want to do some creative stuff in my classroom. I want to do maybe some movie posters or some Nat Geo stuff. You've inspired me. What can I do right away this weekend to get myself ready for next week's 
That's a wonderful question that you <laughs> asked right there. And uh, my dear friend, I mentioned it before, Brian Briggs, and I mentioned Andy Losick, and another dear friend up from the Great White North, Jen Giffen, and I have been spending the entire month of December putting together a bunch of things that you can create with Chrome and a little bit of a day-to-day calendar kind of a thing. Open this little date up, and all of a sudden, here's a different event. These are small, bite-sized, wintery-themed ideas that if you just want to get going with Chrome. And it, it is, and we made a little a bitly shortcut for it, and it's called bit.ly slash create advent. And Brian has taken the lead on this, Brian Briggs, in terms of um, the idea that every day you click on it and you open something up and here is, you know, everything simple, some sort of uh, make a snowman. Like Eric Kurtz has, has had to create the digital make a snowman, I think, in drawing or slides for mm-hmm. a long time. And it's just been really easy to be able to do. And so jump in with some of these things. There's some really fun tools. And since it is only December 14th, we're going to keep on going. we got about another 10 more days of putting these things together, a new one releasing. And so like today's was mine and mine was like, hey, how to be able to use Canva, how to be able to do uh, give thanks. Um, I'm going to be doing another one for a little little winter magazine out there. So check that thing out. Uh, And like I mentioned before, my website, if you want to be able to see some of my a template that you can get if you, if you go to creativeedtech.com and then on the link you click on templates and you can see if you scroll down I got a Time magazine I got the Nat Geo that's on there these ones are older too but there's still a, a lot of people really kind of dig them I, I have an old one of those infographics of my summer by the numbers and even another couple fun ones too I decided to go beyond the uh, magazine idea and say let's use a, a cool online video editor kind of a thing called Luna Pick and be able to turn some of my photos into into comic books and so I made like a comic book template, which people seem to really kind of dig. And you just basically take whatever photos that you want, you give them a comic book feel, and then you make your own little comic book with this template that I made. And inside the template, I got logos for like DC Comics and Marvel. And I plus got cool little shapes that you often see and, and call outs that you would see in a, in a comic book. And so, yeah, those are all uh, Google Docs that you guys can click over there and to be able to download. So a lot of great opportunities. And I would say start small, start something simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't go big. Don't go like a, you know, don't do a a one month lesson your first mm-hmm. time out of the gate start with mm-hmm. something like a like a magazine cover or the movie posters mm-hmm. type of mm-hmm. a project to just get the students ready yeah, I would almost even hint them and say, hey, guys, when you come back from the winter break, I want to hear uh, you know five things that you did over the winter break, and I'm going to give you a Google Doc. And uh, you could preload it ahead of time with a wintery color theme or something like that, or you could be able to just give them and go straight from that, and they're going to come back in right from the day, and they're going to be doing one, they're learning those tools and the layers, and, and you can, it depends on how deep you want to go. You want to get into color theory. I talk about color theory and there's a lot of great websites to be able to you guys can do about, you know, which color theme to pick. Adobe Color has got one of the gorgeous color wheels. It gives you, you just spin the wheel around and you can tweak it and it gives you all these corresponding colors based on, you know, the different color combinations that work. So you can dive into color, you can get into all that kind of stuff. And the other cool part is that they're sharing. They're talking about their own uh, stuff and, and they can turn it in or you can have them present or you can print them out and put them up on the thing. That's a cool part about all these things is although we say paperless, I printed out my, my summer vacation comic book and that's like the biggest hit when people see that like you could print that <laughs> I'm like, yes they're like oh something digital can get printed write that down Tom. and it's like what the heck yeah some people have yeah. already forgotten that we that we used to be able and to you print, can print those cool yeah. things yeah <laughs> like i do a cool like I, I made one for twitter i made a little twitter template that you can be able to make your own and i did that uh for the in our create with chrome as well too like my daughter made one for buddy the elf because she loves the uh uh, the movie Elf. And so she made that. But I had a history teacher do a bunch of Cold War leaders. And what if they had Twitter? And mm-hmm. so she made all of their little Twitter profiles. And then they printed them all out, put them throughout the room and sort of like a gallery walk. And then the kids walked around with post-it notes and were writing because a post-it note, like a tweet, that's mm-hmm. as much as you got. And they would write little uh, tweets and they would put them and they would layer them down on this Twitter stream that was all printed and done in real life just on their on their little Cold War leaders. Very cool. But that's, I mean, take that and then put a QR code and have somebody acting out those, right? Oh, they yeah. could they could become the character with <laughs> a QR cool, code. Yeah. You could you could then take I mean, I could see so much extension and the connection back to learning on all of these pieces. And that that gets me just so fired up. I, I just I get so excited when I hear and and see like, okay, I can start app smashing now, right? I can start mm-hmm. taking you know, something from Flipgrid or something here and something there. I I get, I don't know. My brain starts going crazy. And then I'm like, I want to, and I think I could even do this with graduate students coming into the new semester. They could take, you know, they could start doing an infographic by the numbers as grad students and see how, because they're all in-service teachers in theory. Mm -hmm. 
and how they could take that and do it in their classrooms. That's usually what I make them do is I make them do something and then go try it out in their classroom and then come back and reflect on it. And I mm-hmm. love that kind of stuff. Heads up. Yeah. You might get yeah, this assignment. Todd Schmidt's a principal and he does, he does some uh, uh, working with some in-service teachers and he has, he's been having a bunch of them use some of my templates and infographics and such. And it's really neat to be able to, and he's also, it's, Todd's great. He's telling them all like, Hey, share it on Twitter and like get used to that community. I'm seeing all these yeah. sort of like these young teachers sharing these cool things that they're making. So yeah. Uh, it just, great. it gets me excited when I see mm-hmm. that these, you know, new service, pre-service and even current in-service teachers are doing all this really cool stuff stuff that that's mind blowing to them, you know, Mm. like they think they know everything that they're digital natives. And then all of a sudden they're like, "Mm, maybe I'm not so much. That's an excellent point. We all say, Oh, the kids these days (laughs) are so great. I'm ah, ah." They don't because they're back to the consumer piece. So many of them know how to consume. Yeah. Consuming media is different than creating media with Mm -hmm. intent and purpose and, Mm -hmm. um, and content. So I'm, you know, I'm really happy that, that, that we're on the same page and that we're on the same team. I love it. I love it. Get more of us out there. Create, 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 and, and talk about it and share it on social media and Mm -hmm. listen to podcasts and get inspired. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, we want to kind of wrap everything up. Brenda likes to ask a couple of questions kind of in, in closing as we, Think about wrapping up our uh, mm-hmm. our episode here. What do you got, Brenda? Well, uh, one thing I always like to ask is any books that have made an impact on you, either professionally or personally. Um, is is reading listening? Yes, yes. we are, we've Good. already determined that. Hundred yes. percent. <laughs> gotcha. And I do enjoy reading too, but it's it, it's a bit of a challenge, and so my reading primarily is only during breaks. Uh, but I listen a lot and I vary, uh, I vary in my levels of listening. I go from uh, my short form listening as I do a fair amount of podcast listening. And then I like to be able to do the long form doing audio books. So definitely do both. If I could just put in a, a, a thing for listening, if you guys listen, uh, share it out on hashtag now listening. And it's something I just love to do. I'm out with my phone all the time. I like working in the yard. I like you know, being out and listening to things. And when I do, I'll try to just pause and I love using pocket casts and I'll share it out and I'll just say, Hey, listen, hashtag now listening. And I'll also like to let people know that this is something podcasty. So a bunch of us in the podcast community are really big proponents of the hashtag called podcast edu, mm-hmm. which is something that nobody owns. Nobody runs. It's just, Hey, I made something about education. Check it out. Or I listen to somebody else and I have nothing to do with this, but I listen to it. You should, you know, right. this is what I'm listening to. So, so I just would like to be able to do, if I'm listening to something, I just take a screenshot when I'm listening, go to pocket cash, share the link out, hashtag now listening, hashtag podcast edu. There's my quick two cents nice. on that. Yes. But a book that I've listened to recent and not even recently, this may have been about a year ago, but he is my favorite in terms of podcaster and author. And that's Malcolm Gladwell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's just, his podcast revisionist history is just so, mm-hmm. just so unbelievable. And even his books too. And so I'd like to be able to share, if you haven't read it, Outliers. Outliers. Right. It's just so good. And it's mm-hmm. really kind of about, about success, about, and it's all these stories of people who have had success that have not come from what you necessarily think they have done. And like the idea that success really isn't coming from sort of like this vacuum. And it's not always based on intelligence. It's often right. about hard work and opportunity and really sort of inspiring about. So then what we can do as educators to create those opportunities for people to be able to succeed. And it's just really inspiring. It's just a wonderful, he's, he, he does such a good job of storytelling mm-hmm. and with the research behind it. Well, and even defining success, mm-hmm. you right? Like success has such an interesting definition because it, it, it means something different to different people. So I, I think that that was one of the things that I remember uh, as I was putting this book in my audible cart. <laughs> oh, yay. <laughs> was, um, <laughs> and it's been, it's been in my, it's, it's been in my library for quite a while is that the definition of success is, is not necessarily financial all the time in right. in a lot of these stories that he talks about. It's kind of bootstrapping and coming up from the bottom and, and how each of these ind- individuals are defining their own success in the spaces that they're in, right? Is that? Fantastic. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm excited that you're going to give it a listen. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> it's been, it's been in my library. I, I, I read about 30 or listen to about 30 books a year. And oh, this boy. year I might come short because I, I listened to The Goldfinch, which was 35 hours, and I feel like that should count as three, but it only counted as one. Like, that was a long book. It was, but to go what we just said, how are you defining success? Exactly, Who cares? Right. right. I, I have put a number on my uh, on my her goals. On my goal. So, uh, <laughs> but I listen. We, we covered this in a previous podcast. I listen on 1.75. 
Mm -hmm. or 2.0. So I can consume almost twice as fast as the average bear. So I like to... It's interesting. We saw our favorite podcaster of all time, Briggs, myself, and a couple others. And we went... And he's not education, but he's a tech guy. His name's Leo Laporte, and he does the... Love uh, Leo Laporte. uh, (laughs) Yeah. And so we've gone out there a couple... uh, Twice in in the past couple of years, and we listened to him. And both times we went out there, the first time it was odd. We felt like we went to get lunch afterwards, and we're like, he, he must not be feeling well. And then we realized, like, oh, no. Holy, we just used to listen to him at, at 1.5. And you're like, no, he's much slower in person. It's, you just have to speed it up. And then you think that that's really how everything ta- oh, yeah, everything right. is so much faster. It's wonderful because yeah. you can consume faster. And that's what I that's yes. what I like. You can't get enough. So, well, we want to thank you. Yes, uh, we're big fans. Yeah. Yay, <laughs> thank you, guys. I mean, we Thank love... you for what you're doing because the, the more people that are out, we're sharing and, and, and connecting with people. I think it's just, it's wonderful. It's it's amazing. And we hope to, we're for sure going to see you at Q yes. in March. Um, and, and so anyone who's going to Q can come and find us and meet us and get to know there's going to be a Meet the Podcasters session, kind of a poster session where the podcasters who are all in this Q ed tech space will be available to not do recordings, but like a do meet and greets and that kind of yeah. stuff and, and share and give pass out stickers and all that kind of cool stuff. Yeah. So. And when you see people of those things, go to them, say hi. And most of us, right. you know, you, uh, much like I said, it's tough for our kids to be able to go out and say, I'm here to do the yoga club. It's often tough for, tough for us to be able to go to things. He's like, oh, hey, there's someone. So, hey, we're all just educators. We're all in the same boat, man. And so just go up and say, hey, I saw this. I got this link from you. I got whatever, you know, and that's right. what's great about them. I wish that we could live in a world where we all have name badges. It would be fantastic <laughs> so we can recognize each other <laughs> yeah. because we all live in social media. We don't know who the heck everybody even is once we see them in person. Well, and especially so, when you have like animated faces or something. We're oh, always yeah. wearing our purple shirts when we're out yep. in public. So uh, we've had yeah. people come up and be like, oh, we listen to your podcast. And that's always yeah. super fun. And that's me. I'm the super, it looks like intense Jedi guy. Yes. People are like, oh, wow, you're a lot larger in person. Yeah. I'm like, yes. Doesn't come across in a headshot. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. But usually when you hear someone's voice, you're like, I know that voice. That's right. That's yeah. the voice. That's yeah. that's who I listen to. Yeah. Hey, so, this has been a lot of fun, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thank well, you. Thank you for thank joining you us. Thank you for joining us. And we'll link all of, the, all of the resources that you talked about. We'll all be linked up in our show notes. And um, we look forward to seeing you again in real life in a couple of months. See you then. All All right. right. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, And we're out. Thanks for listening to the MyTech Tool Belt podcast. If you have enjoyed listening, please rate us on Apple Podcasts or send us some feedback on our website, mytechtoolbelt.com. We would love to hear from you. This will help us deliver the content that you want to hear. Thanks. And we're out.